Okay. Just share, share so. Hello, not yet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everybody. <laughs> um, I just want to say hello to everyone. Um, thank you for joining the Foundation for Animal Care and Education's webinar on common emergencies and your pets. Um, I want you to see the lovely Dr. O'Donnell before she shares her screen. <laughs> um, so my name is Annie Peterson, and I'm the Education Manager for the FACE Foundation, and I will moderate today's webinar. The FACE Foundation, for those of you who, don't, who do not know, is a nonprofit organization that helps to pre prevent economic euthanasia in our community due to financial limitations of their pet parents. Um, before we get started, I know many of you are very familiar with Zoom, but I'm going to go ahead and go over a few things. Um, all of you are muted to avoid background noise, and the camera feature is turned off so we can focus all of our attention on Dr. O'Donnell. You will have an opportunity to ask questions throughout the presentation by typing them in using the chat feature. Um, sometimes I do have people use the Q&A. Either one is fine. Um, we'll, we'll get those questions. Um, and they will be answered toward the end of the presentation. Um, when typing in your question into chat or Q&A, you will have two options. One is everyone. One is for the panelists. Um, if you want it to be anonymous, just choose my name, Annie Peterson, and then I can relay it to uh, Dr. O'Donnell toward the end. So Dr. Erica O'Donnell attended UC Davis School of Veterinary Medicine, where she obtained her doctorate of veterinary medicine. She is a member of the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons in the UK, and she completed her residency at the Veterinary Specialty Hospital. In 2020, Dr. O'Donnell was accepted as a diplomat in the American College of Veterinary Emergency and Critical Care. And we want to thank Dr. O'Donnell for being here with us today. And the floor is yours. And if you want to go ahead and share your screen now, you can. Okay. There we go. Uh, well, thank you so much for everyone that is, um, I don't know what the correct term is, calling in, tuning in <laughs> um, to hear this presentation. Um, so my goal is to kind of um, go through a lot of the common emergencies that we see. Um, I was just telling Annie um, while we're waiting for this to start that, you know, any one of these topics I could spend you know, an hour a day on. Um, so we'll just try to touch on some of the more common things. Um, I know we're in a very scary time right now and, um, you know, even more so than before, you know, once your pet's in, uh, you know, the emergency room, um, I think my clients at least have expressed they feel a lot more separated from the whole process um, just with COVID rules and things like that. So I'm hoping to just impart a little bit of knowledge, um, some kind of tips and tricks and um, and things as we go through. Um, and then um, as Annie said, any questions you have at the end, definitely um, feel free to share those. Um, so this is a picture um, of uh, the hospital I work at now, which is our um, VSH location in San Marcos. Um, and just to show um, everyone experiences emergencies, even us. And so, you know, we know uh, all of us how kind of scary it can be. Um, this was on a day where a, an adjacent business has a kind of a smoke smell coming. So the fire department got to come. So we were sort of on the other side of it, um, experiencing uh, sort of emergency ourselves. So I just wanted to start off um, before we sort of go through the topics with kind of what is an emergency, because I think that's kind of a big question, um, you know, and I'll loop myself in this at home with my own pet, you know, what really is an emergency? Is this worth contacting an ER? Um, you know, is it worth a vet seeing my pet? Is it something I can wait for my primary care vet to see? Um, so there's a lot of different definitions for an emergency. So if you kind of, you know, Google it or look in Merriam-Webster, um, some of the various definitions are, um, you know, serious, unexpected often dangerous situation that requires immediate action, a medical condition requiring immediate treatment, any situation that poses an immediate risk to health, life, property, or environment. Um, but in reality, really, you know, at least for myself as a criticalist, I consider an emergency any serious change in the condition or behavior of your pet that concerns you. So, you know, you know your pet best. Um, and so, a lot of times, you know, I've, I've had clients say, oh, they're, you know, they're just acting a little bit off and it ends up being something serious. So, you know, your pet best. And again, we'll go through some of the conditions that, you know, definitely are considered emergencies um, to kind of help you navigate that. 
Um, and then one important word that, um, you know, if you've taken your pet through the emergency room, you've probably heard or, you know, watching Grey's Anatomy or whatever, um, heard the word triage. So that word comes from the French verb trier, meaning to sort or to choose. Um, so that's basically the process by which patients are classified according to how urgent and what type of condition they have to get the right patient to the right place as quickly as is appropriate. So triage is a system that we apply to every pet coming through the emergency room. We base that on what the client is telling us, what the triage nurse is seeing on their quick cursory exam um, to try and sort them um, to you know how urgent they are, get them to the best place as quickly as possible. Um, you know, I put a picture of a stoplight there. Some hospitals and human hospitals are included in this will use some sort of, you know, green, yellow, red um, kind of scorecard system um, based on urgency or letters or numbers to try and sort through, um, you know, especially with with COVID, we've definitely had a very large increase in our emergency caseload, um, trying to figure out, you know, who needs to be seen the most urgently and who can wait a little bit longer when we're sort of, um, you know, sorting through our patients that are presenting to us. So I tried to, um, you know, I called it top 10, I'm cheating a little bit. Um, it's not really the top 10 emergencies, but more so kind of top 10, I guess, organ systems that we um, see through the ER. Um, number 10 is definitely a cheat category. It has more than, more than one type of thing in there. Um, but it was, you know, again, a little ambitious, I think, to cover everything as much detail as you know, maybe some of you would like in one hour, but I wanted to at least touch on um, the most common types of emergencies that we see and also emphasize to you kind of which ones are definitely true, true emergencies that we'd want you to bring your pet in um, as soon as possible. So we'll kind of go through um, each of these sort of top 10 um, body systems. And then within each one, there's sort of a, you know, a few individual diseases in there. So for GI emergencies, the most common, um, and again, I say most common, there's you know dozens, hundreds of, of different things that we see. So we're just touching on the most common, um, vomiting, diarrhea, bloat, um, and then GDV or gastric dilatation and volvulus. So we'll go through those in a little bit more detail. Um, so vomiting, I think probably if I had to choose is the most common presenting complaint that we see to the emergency room. Um, I've listed kind of the most common um, disease processes that we see. Um, you know, fortunately, <laughs> dietary indiscretion is um, probably one of the more common um, reasons that we see pets vomiting. And so whether that's, um, you know, they got people food, they have a new treat, you know, we switched dog foods too quickly, they got in the trash, got into who knows what. Um, so that's kind of a, a catch-all term for eating something that is outside of their normal. Um, gastroenteritis is also very common. So, you know, upset tummy is kind of the colloquial term for that. Um, it basically means inflammation of the stomach or intestines. That can also be for many different reasons. Sometimes dietary indiscretion will result in gastroenteritis. Um, foreign bodies or foreign material, also very common. So whether or not that leads to an obstruction, um, you know, can kind of dictate the urgency of things. Um, and actually included a, an x-ray um, down in the corner there that the arrows are pointing at a sock um, foreign body in the intestine. So um, as you know, we'll get to diagnostics, but we can oftentimes see evidence of that on x-rays. Um, pancreatitis, so inflammation of the pancreas, which is an organ that helps with our digestion. Um, its job is to release enzymes to help us digest food. Um, but when the pancreas gets upset, uh, whether it's from primary pancreatitis or whether it's from something else, um, releases a lot more of those enzymes, which kind of you know affect the GI tract and, and causes inflammation there, which can result in, in vomiting. Um, and other systemic disease, so that's a very big broad category, but a lot of other organ dysfunctions, um, other metabolic problems can definitely cause vomiting as well. So um, it's one of those, you know, kind of non-specific things, but can be caused by a lot of different things. So if your pet's vomiting, um, always very safe to kind of seek care of your veterinarian to try and figure out what's going on. Um, some of the diagnostics that help us do that um, are imaging. So abdominal x-rays is Again, you can see in the corner, um, and this pet has a lot of different, my mouse is gonna work, um, a lot of different um, kind of markers or evidence for obstruction. So um, each of these um, tubular things here, are intestinal loops, so those are way, way, way bigger than they should be. Um, and again, in this pet, you could actually see the, um, what turned out to be a sock um, foreign body there. Um, blood work, um, very helpful in trying to help us figure out if a pet's dehydrated, if they have systemic disease that either caused the vomiting or is secondary to dehydration or, you know, shock from losing a lot of water in their vomiting. Um, so blood work is, is definitely a mainstay in the workup for, um, you know, trying to determine the underlying cause for vomiting. 
Um, treatment is going to depend on the underlying cause. So, you know, if our pets are having some sort of dietary indiscretion, gastroenteritis type um, scenario, those pets benefit from supportive care. So fluids, anti-nausea medication, sometimes antacids. So similar to what a person would take if you had acid reflux or, you know, an upset stomach. Um, things like foreign bodies that are causing obstruction, um, those are going to most of the time need surgery if we can't kind of supportively treat those pets. Um, but that's kind of dictated by sort of, you know, what our workup kind of figures out for us. Um, diarrhea is going to have a lot of the same causes. So, um, you know, eating something we shouldn't. Um, foreign material can sometimes cause diarrhea. Um, parasites, so definitely in our puppy, pop, puppy and kitten population, um, we can, you know, kind of have parasites on the list there. Um, stress, uh, so you know, stress colitis is kind of the fancy word for diarrhea resulting from stress. So it's definitely something that we, we see. So whether it's, you know, the owners have been out of town, the pets been boarding, you know, whatever other stressful situation can certainly cause diarrhea. Um, inflammatory bowel disease, so kind of similar to IBS in people, um, is more of a chronic condition, but can definitely result in diarrhea. Um, and again, systemic disease, so really, you know, any organ dysfunction potentially could cause, um, cause diarrhea secondarily. Um, diagnostics, uh, again, a lot the same. Um, imaging wise, we tend to um, more use ultrasound in these situations. It's a little bit more sensitive for seeing the actual layering of the intestines. Um, so down here in the corner is an ultrasound image of a stomach. Um, and, uh, you know, we can see there's kind of these little stripes here. So the stomach and the intestines all have multiple layers. So ultrasound tends to be a better diagnostic um, for looking at the GI tract for diseases that are causing diarrhea. But depending on the scenario, um, you know, your vet may consider x-rays as well, depending on what's going on. Um, blood work, again, systemic health, dehydration, um, proteins can be lost a lot in diarrhea. So we'll often check those. Um, and fecal testing would be added onto the list here, again, depending on the pet's age and you know what all has been going on with them in their history. Um, treatment similar to vomiting going to depend on the underlying cause um, may involve fluids if they're dehydrated, dewormers if they have parasites, um, probiotics in some cases and then some pets will use um, antibiotics as well depending on, on the cause. Okay, so bloat, um, and I differentiated bloat from GDV because they are technically um, different. So bloat is when a pet has a stomach that's distended, but is still in the normal position. So um, the x-ray that I've included here has a, uh, an animal with a stomach very full, probably based on the appearance, I'd say full of food, um, or you can have air. So um, on x-rays, air is going to be black. So um, you can kind of see here one little bit of the lungs peeking in there. So air is black. So all this kind of density is probably food if I had to guess. Um, so diagnostics, um, you know, definitely x-rays um, to see what's going on and make sure the stomach isn't malpositioned and that we're getting into a GDV situation, which will be the next disease that we'll talk about. Um, blood work sometimes. So again, depending on the condition of the animal, um, we may want to run some blood work, um, especially if they're very, you know, distended and uncomfortable. There are some markers that we'll want to check. Um, treatment generally consists of fluids, um, NPO, which means not giving them anything by mouth um, to let everything just kind of pass through and not add anything to the, um, to the burden that's already in the stomach. Um, pain medications if needed. So if they're really uncomfortable, um, you know, it's kind of akin to just eating a really gigantic Thanksgiving meal and then you're like, I regret this, um, I'm in pain. So um, pain medication if needed. Um, sometimes we'll pass a nasogastric tube, which is a tube from the, tube from the nose into the stomach. Um, really, we only do that with air bloats um, because putting a small tube into the stomach is not going to relieve any of this stuff. So um, most of the time we reserve that for when they're bloated with air. So if they've been, you know, panting and stressed and just kind of, you know, ingesting a lot of air, so to speak, um, we'll sometimes place that tube temporarily. Um, this case is usually not surgical. So most of the time we'll get them on fluids, keep them in the hospital for the night, repeat x-rays in the morning, just to make sure that all of that's kind of moving its way out and just give them a little bit of time. Um, on the other hand, um, GDV, which um, I forgot to note earlier, anything that's written in red um, as far as a disease is something that can be life-threatening. So I had mentioned before, you know, there's a plethora of hundreds of diseases that can affect your pet, but the ones that um, I've written in red are definitely ones that can be life-threatening very quickly. 
Um, so GDV is rapidly progressive. Um, that's when the stomach not only bloats, but it twists. And so I included a little cartoon there at the bottom to kind of um, depict that. So why this is so dangerous is that when the stomach twists and it can twist um, you know, anywhere between 180 to 360 degrees, um, it cuts off the blood supply, not just to the stomach, but to other organs um, in the area. And that can result in death of the stomach fairly quickly. Um, there's poor blood flow to other organs, um, combination of those blood vessels physically kind of getting taken along for the ride and twisted. Um, and also when the stomach gets large, it's physically cutting off blood flow, usually from the back half of the body. Um, and that results in poor oxygen delivery to the whole body. And so we can very quickly get organ damage. We can get cardiac arrhythmias. So it's definitely a very serious condition. Signs, um, some of them are going to overlap with bloat. So I will say if your pet's exhibiting any of these signs, it's always recommended um, for your pet to be assessed as soon as possible. Um, you know, some of these signs are also non-specific. I mean, our pets can drool and pant for a lot of different reasons, but if your pet um, is a breed that's at risk, so really any deep chested breed, so Danes, Labs, um, you know, Dobermans, those kind of breeds that have very deep chest, um, are, are shown to be at higher risk. Um, so dry heaving, restlessness, um, sometimes their, their belly will look distended, visibly bloated. Um, they can vomit. Um, often it's described as kind of a non-productive retching. So they're acting like they need to vomit, but nothing's really coming up. Um, if they're drooling, panting, certainly if they collapse, um, which we'll cover kind of other reasons for collapse a little bit later. Um, if they're weak, um, you know, if, if you're an owner with a little bit of, you know, medical knowledge or ability to kind of appreciate pulses or feel a heart rate that may be high. Um, so any collection of those signs in a breed at risk is definitely a reason to get them right into the ER. Um, so the sooner we can act on a GDV, the better. Um, risk factors, there have been a lot of different studies throughout the years um, over the last few decades that have tried to pin down. Um, there's a lot of old wives tales and things that, um, you know, are not proven. There are factors that were shown in one study, not another. Um, so I've kind of listed out some of the ones that are pretty consistently across the board shown to be um, things that increase the risk for GDV and in, in at-risk breeds. Um, so again, deep chest conformation. Um, one study showed the dogs that were fed, again, risk breeds, um, fed a single meal once a day were also at higher risk. Um, older dogs and relatives that had GDV, so there may be some genetic link potentially. Um, other things were suggested, but not maybe as strongly proven were elevated feedings, previous splenectomy, um, again, larger giant breeds, and then also stress. Um, also commonly associated with large meals um, as well. So this is what a GDV looks like on an x-ray. So we kind of call it like a Popeye arm um, or a double bubble. So um, you kind of saw in the previous x-ray what a bloat looked like. So the stomach was, you know, one big kind of oval or circle. And you can see here in this x-ray, it's sort of like a, you know, like a Popeye bicep arm here or, you know, double bubble. Um, so what that indicates is that the stomach has twisted and is in the wrong position. So you know, sometimes we'll, you know, ask you at the outset, you know, do we have permission to just grab an x-ray? Um, and if we have this appearance in, in this particular um, positioning in this view, um, that's diagnostic for a GDB. So your, your vet or your triage nurse may ask, you know, after kind of checking out your dog may say, oh, I'm, I'm worried your, your pet may have this going on. Are you okay if we grab an x-ray? Um, so this is kind of the view that we're looking for to diagnose that. Um, so diagnostics, um, physical exam as well. So if we have kind of this big um, tympanic stomach, if they're kind of retching and doing the things that we just mentioned, um, blood work, um, again, we can have many systemic side effects from GDV once that stomach bloats and is kind of cutting everything off. There's several markers as far as, um, you know, blood work stability, so to speak, that we would like to check. Um, and because we can be predisposed to cardiac arrhythmias, um, we will uh, often want to get a, an ECG as well, an electrocardiogram to check for cardiac arrhythmias because some of those can also be very life-threatening. Um, treatments, uh, so often, uh, again, because of this poor blood flow, these pets need fluids, um, may or may not need oxygen. So depending on kind of how big the stomach is at the time, if it's compressing, you know, the lungs and, you know, kind of pushing up on this diaphragm here and not allowing the animal to take big full breaths, um, they may need some oxygen supplementation temporarily. 
um, uh, depending on the timing of, uh, you know, going to surgery, which this is a surgical condition, um, we may need to decompress the stomach if it's going to be a little bit of time for whatever reason um, to see the surgeon, um, then we may decompress either using a catheter through the side of the body wall um, to basically let as much air out as possible. Um, you know, rarely does it fix the, you know, really will let the stomach flip back, but it does buy us some time, allow some blood flow to be restored, at least until we can get into surgery and get the stomach actually un untwisted. Um, so again, this is a surgical condition. And so what the surgeon will do is um, go in through the belly, um, they'll flip the stomach back and then uh, perform what's called a gastropexy. So I'm sorry if it's a little um, graphic of a picture for some of you, but, um, and this is a laparoscopic view. So most of the time we do this as an open surgery, but I just thought it was a nice picture from this hospital. Um, what it looks like where the stomach is basically sewed to the side of the body wall um, internally. So that basically minimizes or mitigates the chance of the twist happening again. So these pets can still bloat, um, which as we discussed before is rarely life-threatening, um, but this pretty much prevents um, the rotation of the stomach, which is the, the fatal part of the syndrome. Um, so trauma, um, again, I could talk for you know days and days about trauma, um, but I'll just go through quickly some of the um, main causes of trauma that we see, um, and then a few of the common disease processes that we see as well as a result of trauma. Um, so the main causes that we typically see, um, hit by car is probably the most common, um, or vehicular trauma, um, falling from a height. And so whether that's, uh, you know, our little dogs jumping off the couch or a big dog jumping, you know, off of a big retainer wall or something, um, unfortunately, um, accidentally dropping or kicking our pets, um, fighting with another animal, jumping off the furniture out of a car, um, and then head trauma. So fractures, um, probably most often um, from vehicular trauma, again, um, being stepped on or dropped, usually for our little, little babies like Chihuahuas and Maltese and things like that. Um, jumping down, um, similarly, some of our little um, finer boned uh, dogs are at risk for even you know, jumping off the couch. I've seen fractures happen from that. Um, usually it's gonna be a long bone. So the radius or ulna, um, the humerus, and then, then the hind limb, the femur, the tibia. Um, we can also get little toe fractures and rib fractures as well. Usually those are gonna occur from a vehicular trauma. Um, sometimes um, it can be disturbing. You can actually see the fracture or the displacement of the limb. Um, sometimes you can't. So definitely our femur, you know, up here, the thigh bone fractures. Um, sometimes the upper arm bone, the humerus, you can't always see um, outwardly because we have a lot of muscle covering those bones. Um, but definitely, you know, our little forearm fractures, especially in our little doggies that don't have a lot of, you know, tissue surrounding, um, you, can, you can definitely see the displacement sometimes. Um, X-rays are, are going to be our diagnostic of choice for those. Um, if they go on to need surgery, we'll do things like blood work and whatnot, but X-rays are, are usually what we're going to recommend to try and tell if a dog is lame because of a fracture um, or because of something else, which I kind of touched on in the, in the other uh, section. Um, treatment, so we'll get pain meds on board as soon as we can, because of course this is very, goes without saying, very painful. Um, we'll either splint uh, and bandage uh, or surgical fixation. So it kind of depends on where the fracture is, how unstable, what size dog it is. Um, we'll kind of go into either the ER doctor or the surgeon's decision about which of those is recommended. Okay, so pleural space disease. So basically what that means is just the space in the chest around the lungs. So um, pneumothorax is, um, you know, something that you may have uh, heard heard of before. Um, so pneumo means air, thorax, you know, in the thorax of the chest. Um, so we can have open, closed, or tension. Um, that is definitely a red, um, that can definitely cause um, cardiac collapse pretty quickly. Um, hemothorax, which is blood in the chest, I kind of made like a light non-committal red color. Um, usually those aren't as imminently life-threatening to our pets um, because unless there's some clotting problem, they're usually doing a, a decent job at kind of clotting whatever the bleed is. Um, it does not mean that it can't be fatal, which is why I kind of made it red, um, but it doesn't tend to be as rapidly progressive um, or as dangerous as quickly as the pneumothorax. Again, these are you know gross generalizations, of course. Um, so for diagnostics, we may do a bedside ultrasound or a FAST scan. Um, that is a, um, you know, something, a tool that they use in human medicine as well. So it's not a full ultrasound with a specialist, but it is basically looking for fluid, looking for air, looking for obvious things very quickly. So it's kind of like a, you know, trauma triage type of ultrasound um, blood work. And then we'll want to check our oxygenation status as well with a pulse ox, which is the little thing they put on your finger um, when you go to the doctor just to check your oxygen level. 
um, treatments, uh, again, depends on how affected the animal is, the dog or the cat, um, you know, what all big picture wise is going on with them. Um, so treatments may um, include a chest tap um, or thoracocentesis is kind of the fancy word for that. Um, may need a chest tube placed. So depending on how quickly the air fluid is building up, um, again, depending on the animal's overall stability, we may place an actual indwelling tube into the chest. Um, pain medications, as most of the time these are from trauma, not always. Um, plus or minus the blood transfusion um, if the pet's bleeding um, either is uncontrollable or if they've bled to a point where they're anemic, um, then we'll give them a blood transfusion. Um, and then surgery um, sometimes is indicated or not, depending on the cause and, and how stable the pet is. Um, for wounds, um, most often uh, we see bite wounds. So they got in a fight with their housemate or, you know, at the dog park or whatnot. Um, occasionally we'll see unknown trauma. So they were just outside, came back in, have a wound, no idea what happened. Um, generally our wounds are going to be more dangerous if they're penetrating into a body cavity. So your veterinarian may recommend x-rays or ultrasound to try and tell if that's happening. Um, of course, you know, our mouths are dirty and have bacteria in them and our dogs are the same. So when a bite happens and bacteria are kind of, you know, inoculated into a wound and especially if they get into a body cavity that can cause very serious infection, can cause secondary um, trauma or damage to internal organs. So that's something that your veterinarian may recommend doing um, blood work um, and then sometimes a culture of the wounds again with the bacteria in there. It's nice to know um, what bacteria it is and what antibiotics are effective. Um, so that's oftentimes something we recommend uh, when dealing with bite wounds. Um, treatments. Um, so clipping and cleaning is kind of the first thing we'll, we'll do after getting some pain medication on board um, to try and clear as much hair, dirt, debris away as we can. Um, we'll clean the wound with either sterile saline or dilute antiseptic. Um, get a feeling for kind of how deep it is. We can't always get a complete look um, just from the outside, but try and get an idea of how deep the wound is, how extensive if it's something that needs to be done, you know, in an OR with a surgeon to repair it, or if it's something that on an emergency basis we can repair, is it something that's going to need a drain? Um, so down here is a picture of a dog that has what's called a Jackson Pratt drain. It looks kind of like a little grenade and sucks the sucks the fluid and air out, um, and uh, you know, fluids, antibiotics, and other supportive measures as well. Um, so high-rise syndrome, um, pretty uncommon here in San Diego, um, more common in urban cities. So I guess, you know, downtown San Diego, you could consider um, generally falling from greater than three stories is kind of what we call a uh, high-rise injury. Um, greater than three stories and based on the literature is more likely to result in abdominal injury, um, whereas our much higher falls, so greater than seven stories, um, more likely to cause thoracic trauma. Um, so a lot of the kind of constellation of injuries we see are, you know, we've kind of discussed already. So um, pneumothorax, fractures, um, bleeding into a body cavity. Um, so diagnostics are similar to what we've discussed, um, blood work, bedside ultrasound. We may x-ray, we may do a CT scan. So um, sometimes it's uh, quicker and more cost effective to do a CT scan than to do a bunch of series of x-rays. So again, depending on the individual, we may do a trauma CT to get the extent of the injuries. Um, treatment depends on underlying cause. So pain medication, um, if they sustained injuries to require that um, oxygen, and then again, depending on what's going on in the chest, potentially a chest tube um, and or surgery if needed. Spinal trauma, um, we can see fractures or relaxations, um, usually from vehicular trauma. So something forceful enough to um, basically, you know, cause entry to those deeper structures under all of our back musculature and things. Um, so signs you may notice are your um, dog or cat not being able to walk, very painful, um, decreased limb strength um, or use and changes in urination or defecation. So definitely if they're not seeming to be able to do those things, that can be very, very serious. Um, diagnostics um, may include x-rays, so we can do what's called survey x-rays, where we kind of, you know, x-ray the spine, as you can see in, in this x-ray image here, and there's a very obvious, um, you know, kind of fracture luxation here. Um, MRI is good for looking at the spinal cord itself. Um, CT is very good for looking at the bones, so depending on what um, area we're worried about being injured, we'll choose one, one or more of those modalities. 
um, treatments, pain medication, of course, um, immobilization is very important. So either a bandage um, or putting them on a board. So the, um, the doggy up in the top right there has been kind of strapped down to a backboard. Um, so similar, you know, if you've ever been in an ambulance or had a neck injury, they'll put the little brace on you. So just to keep you from moving and make your injury much worse. Um, and then treatment is going to be medical or surgical, depending on the extent of the injury and what's going on. Um, head trauma, so we can see pets falling on their heads, being hit by something, also vehicular trauma um, that can result in wounds, brain bleeding or swelling, um, seizures, skull fractures. Um, diagnostics may include blood work, an ECG and a blood pressure, and then possibly x-rays. So x-rays aren't always terribly helpful with the skull just because there's many bones that overlap, but occasionally we will do them to see if there's an obvious skull fracture. Um, treatments are going to consist of pain medication, fluids, um, sometimes medications to decrease brain swelling if we're worried about that, um, and oxygen, again, depending on um, what's going on with the pet. So I would consider this probably in the red category, just because if we experience enough um, brain swelling, um, we can definitely be at risk for um, fatality if that's the case. So really any head trauma, um, even if you think that they're acting normally, um, is fair to get them checked out by your veterinarian. Okay, collapse is kind of a, a big category. So there's a lot of different um, reasons for collapse and some things may look like a collapse episode but aren't actually. Um, so I kind of broke uh, this topic down um, into big categories. So cardiac disease, um, which is a red, um, can definitely be life-threatening. Um, so our pets with very severe bowel disease, um, where they have a leaky valve, they're not getting enough blood flow out to the body and collapse because of that. Um, pulmonary hypertension, which we don't see too commonly in this area, they definitely see it a lot in places at high altitude. Um, arrhythmias, Pericardial effusion is a big cause, especially in our larger breed dogs. So um, that's when there's fluid around the heart. Um, so I've included a little, this is a bedside ultrasound image. Um, so fluid is black on ultrasound. So all of this is um, fluid. So this is here, is, can't sketch it out very well. All this is the heart. Um, so you can see kind of this fluid um, all around the heart and that just doesn't allow the heart to fill normally. And when there's a lot um, that can definitely cause collapse because we're not getting sufficient blood out to the body. Um, Hemoabdomen is definitely, unfortunately, another very common thing that we see causing collapse. Um, that means that there's bleeding into the abdomen. Um, they call it hemoperitoneum in human medicine. Um, trauma can cause this. Um, unfortunately, I think probably the biggest population um, we see in our emergency room is resulting from some sort of bleeding mass. So in the spleen or the liver most commonly. Um, so those pets um, you know, will treat with fluids, blood transfusions if needed, and depending on the cause, they may need surgery. Um, seizures, um, again, not a traditional collapse per se, but I've definitely seen, you know, owners have brought me videos where it did look like they had collapsed, but they were actually having a seizure. Um, anaphylaxis is another big cause for, for collapse. And, you know, you know, some of you out there, um, yourselves may have experienced anaphylaxis before. Um, so we treat that typically with fluids, um, antihistamines, and then sometimes steroids, depending on the case. And I talk about anaphylaxis a little bit more later if we have um, if we have time. Um, diagnostics, blood work, ECG, blood pressure, um, and then imaging to try and, you know, try and figure out which one of these very disparate categories that we're dealing with. Um, I'll probably just speed up a little bit just to make sure we kind of touch on everything. Um, so respiratory emergencies, um, again, many different things, congestive heart failure, asthma, tracheal collapse are the ones that could be fatal if not addressed in an urgent manner. Pneumonia, kennel cough, those tend to be um, a little bit more of an insidious onset or not, um, you know, as systemically affecting respectively. Um, diagnostics, um, chest x-rays are a mainstay for when we have a pet coming in with trouble breathing. Um, and I think this is probably one of the scariest, um, you know, at least for a pet owner, um, signs to see. So if your pet's breathing heavier, faster, they can't seem to catch their breath. Um, pretty much um, anytime your pet's having difficulty breathing or a change in their breathing pattern, especially if they have, you know, one of these pre-existing diseases is always going to be an emergency. So, you know, those respiratory emergencies are, are definitely ones that we want you to bring your pet in right away. Um, urinary emergencies. Um, so I'll just kind of 
touch on signs quickly. Um, so straining to urinate, urinating frequent small amounts, um, painful or difficult urination, blood in the urine, um, if they haven't urinated for a prolonged time. So typically over eight hours, we, you know, want you at least check in with us. Um, you know, some dogs only urinate once or twice a day. So, um, you know, whatever is abnormal for your pet um, and any change in urinary habits going in and out of the box, you know, urinating outside the litter box, urinating in the house um, for our dogs, anything like that. Um, so the most serious um, urinary emergency that we see very, very commonly, probably on a daily basis is urethral blockages. Um, so those can definitely be life-threatening, um, mostly because of the electrolyte derangements that can cause pretty serious cardiac arrhythmias and death. Um, there's a syndrome called fluted, um, FIC was the old name because in veterinary medicine, we have to change the names of things every, every few years. Um, but it's basically a syndrome of any combination of muscle spasm, stress, um, crystal mucus plugs or stones that kind of get lodged in the urethra. In our male cats, just with their anatomy, their urethra is much narrower um, toward the outside. So the urethra is the tube from the bladder to the outside. Um, so this is not a, a problem that we see in female cats. Um, they can become obstructed females, but it's not um, typically because of this syndrome um, that, that I'm describing. Um, so uh, these cats can exhibit any of the signs that um, we discussed earlier, um, but when it becomes concerning is when they're kind of in and out of the box, not producing urine, um, or if they haven't urinated for a long time, or if they seem painful, um, definitely get, get your kitty in right away. Um, so we can often tell pretty much right away on a physical exam just by feeling their bladder um, that that's what's going on. Um, history is very helpful. So if something stressful has been happening or they've had episodes like this before, um, blood work and ECG are things that we'll do pretty quickly to make sure that they're stable. Um, and then we'll get them pain meds, fluids, um, deobstruct them as quickly as possible. Um, and then these cats are typically in the hospital for, um, you know, two to three days to kind of flush their bladder out, get everything cleared up and, and keep their pain under control. Um, toxins. Okay, we'll go through quickly. Excuse me, we're already approaching the end of our time. Um, so most of the time, uh, assessment by your vet as soon as possible is paramount. Um, I've listed some useful information there that's useful for us to have, um, which drug it was, what the active ingredients are, the amount they could have ingested at the time, are there any clinical signs, um, and then Generally speaking, we treat toxins by decontaminating, um, so that's inducing vomiting, um, antidote if it's available for the toxin, um, activate charcoal in supportive care. Um, so there's a couple different types of rodenticides. Um, I'll just breeze through these um, in the interest of time. So there are um, rodenticides that can cause clotting problems. So those are um, war warfarin, um, brodificum, Um, You know, generally we should be keeping our pets away from these uh, anyway, but um, dogs, you know, dogs can find things. Um, so if your pet has been exposed to one, it's very, very helpful for us to have the name of the compound, because um, there's also a neurologic type called bromethylene. Um, both of these can definitely be um, fatal. So, you know, the more information we have about what it is, how much they've eaten, um, the prognosis for the anticoagulant tends to be better, again, depending on when they're brought in and how they respond to therapy. Unfortunately, this bromethylene um, anticoagulant, if they develop severe neurologic signs, unfortunately, the prognosis is very poor. Um, so the best that you can keep these products away from your pets, the better. Um, NSAIDs, so there's human uh, drugs that, you know, dogs can get into our meds. Um, they can get to their own meds. Um, we use them commonly as anti-inflammatories and for pain relief. Um, I put some risk factors there. Um, mainly we worry about GI, kidney, um, and liver. Um, so even if your animal goes on this regularly, um, your vet will often check blood work to make sure that those organs are in order before starting these medications. Um, so history is helpful. Um, we'll do baseline blood work in your analysis. Um, and then typically we'll treat them with charcoal fluids in the hospital and, and gastroprotectants. Um, some pets, if there's bad enough GI bleeding, will need a blood transfusion, but that's pretty rare in my experience. Um, generally, the prognosis is good, um, but if they develop severe organ dysfunction, unfortunately, those pets have a more poor prognosis. So again, the sooner you can get them into us, the better. Um, grapes and raisins, um, documented dogs only. There are anecdotal reports in cats. Um, this is what we call an idiosyncratic toxin, meaning we don't exactly know what the toxic molecule is, um, and it doesn't consistently cause it in and all dogs. So we generally say, or I generally say to my clients, you know, I treat your dog or treat my own dog as if they were going to be that one because it can cause kidney failure. So 
you know, your dog may not necessarily be one of those dogs that is susceptible, but I think, you know, the way that we figure that out is obviously not a way that we would all want to. So um, typically we will induce vomiting depending on the amount of time, um, hospitalize those pets on fluids and check blood work daily to make sure that their kidneys are not being affected. Um, chocolate is definitely a potentially fatal um, compound. So methylxanthines are the um, toxic uh, molecule in there of which caffeine is one. Um, any animal can be affected. Um, they can be agitated. Their heart rate can be high. Um, they can vomit, uh, be ataxic, which is wobbly, um, have tremors or seizures at very high doses. Um, so we'll definitely induce vomiting for these guys in the hospital, um, anticonvulsants if needed or antiarrhythmics if they're developing those things. Uh, marijuana, unfortunately, becoming increasingly common um, that we're seeing through the ER. Um, I've listed some of the signs there. Um, drug test is usually unrewarding because they make different metabolites than we do, um, but your vet may recommend it um, depending on you know, what's going on with your pet. Um, we'll typically decontaminate these guys and keep them on, on fluids. In some cases, some are able to go home and just kind of sleep it off. Um, human meds, there's many, um, try to keep them away from your pet the best you can. Um, if there's any chance they could have gotten into anything, again, bring a list, you know, the name, if it's extended release, how much they could have gotten. And it's often useful to call, call um, excuse me, call poison control on your way, um, just because they have a list of, you know, all the dozens of um, meds that they could possibly get into. Um, I'll probably skip over neurologic emergencies. Sorry, guys, we're running out of time. Um, I'll get to this one since we see this also probably on a daily basis, um, allergic reactions or anaphylaxis, um, most commonly from bee stings. We can also see it in our puppies after vaccines, um, food or environmental things as well. Um, anything from hives to swelling around the eyeballs, this poor little boxer dog has pretty bad, we call periocular swelling, um, muzzle swelling as well, um, weakness, collapse, vomiting, diarrhea, lethargy. Um, so those pets, um, especially if they're having more of the systemic, you know, vomiting, collapsing, anything like that, get them in as soon as you can. Um, and even if they have local swelling and, and hives and things that can escalate into anaphylaxis. So definitely um, something we want you to bring your pet right in for. Um, diagnostics, we'll do blood pressure, ECG, um, a bedside ultrasound in some cases. Um, treatment is generally antihistamines. Um, if they're in severe anaphylaxis, we treat them with epinephrine or adrenaline. Um, obviously all these things are things that should be done at a vet clinic. Um, and if there's any secondary organ damage from their shock, then we, we hospitalize and treat them for that. Um, others that, like I said, we ran out of time even <laughs> talking about the things that I wanted to touch on. Um, rattlesnake envenomation here in this area of Southern California, we see again during high season, which is you know, the earliest bite I've seen is in February, the latest I've seen is November, but generally June to September is kind of the high season where we see multiple cases a day, um, can be life-threatening. So if you are worried your pet's been bitten by rattlesnake, you've seen it, get them into a vet as soon as possible. Um, lameness, um, very common as well, can be caused by a lot of different things. So soft tissue injuries, a muscle sprain or strain, um, orthopedic disease, neurologic dysfunction can also look like lameness. Um, fractures that we talked about before. Um, heat stroke, again, could be a multi-hour lecture in and of itself, um, but that, you know, we see really commonly in the summer, unfortunately. So, um, you know, dogs that have been out hiking or out in the yard um, and not been able to seek shade or cool themselves down can, can develop heat stroke and be very fatal very quickly. Um, and then metabolic emergencies, again, each its own topic, but um, complications from diabetes um, or Addisonian crisis. So that's, um, if you know your dog is an Addisonian, you probably have been instructed by your vet kind of what to look for, um, but also very common things that we see in the ER. Um, so just to summarize, and we kind of breeze through at the end, um, I know emergencies can be scary. Um, there's a lot of different causes for abnormal behavior, clinical signs in your pet. Um, and as I always say, um, you know your pet best. And so if you're worried about something, you know, you're going to notice something subtle in your pet um, that is worth bringing them in or at least getting them checked out. Um, if you're concerned, better safe than sorry. Um, so some hospitals um, with COVID and, and even pre-COVID would have kind of a phone triage system where, um, you know, you could call in and speak to one of the techs or the nurses and kind of say, you know, this is what's going on. And, um, you know, of course, legally, we can only offer so much advice over the phone. Um, but there are certain trigger things like, you know, I have a great Dane and he looks bloated that to us will say, you know, you should bring your pet in um, versus, you know, he's been scratching his ears for a long time. And you say, you know, yes, 
you know, it's definitely bothering them. It's important. Um, but you know, the wait time currently from urgent things is, you know, X many hours. So, um, it, it definitely helps us kind of, um, get you a reasonable expectation of time as well. Um, or an in-person triage. So you come to the ERs, a lot of you have probably experienced if you've had to bring your pets in during, um, during this COVID time, a lot of hospitals are operating off curbside. Um, so a nurse, you know, or a doctor should come out and assess your pet and try and again, put you in kind of that green, green, yellow, red type of, um, of order. Um, so more of an in-person triage. Um, definitely bringing any records, meds, um, as much history as you can is really helpful to us. Um, it will expedite your visit as well to kind of have all that information. Um, if your pet needs to be hospitalized, it often saves you cost. Um, if you bring their medications from home, make sure that they're in their labeled container, um, you know, not just in a baggie because we legally can't administer uh, meds that aren't properly labeled. Um, and then I'll just give a little plug um, from, from our ER and I'm sure ERs across the country as well. Um, just asking you to be patient. Um, we're often working off of a triage system. Um, you know, our caseload has been very high with COVID and probably a lot of you have experienced um, primary care is closing or being limited. Um, so most of the time we are working off of a triage system and, you know, of course, behind closed doors, a lot more is going on than, than we all realize. So um, we truly do try to work through and see our sicker pets sooner through this triage system. Um, every pet is very important to us. And, um, you know, so we just ask that you be um, as patient with us as you can during this, um, during this time and staff shortages and things like that that we've been experiencing. Um, as I said, all pets are important. Um, I know, you know, even when it comes to my own, I just forget everything I know and panic. So um, I definitely, you know, know it's scary when your pet's not feeling well. And so if you're worried, you know, ever at all, um, you know, hopefully some of these things have given you some sort of trigger things to look for to work off of. Um, but really, if you're worried, just, you know, always call either your primary care vet or your local ER. Thank you so much. I know that's a lot <laughs> um of information <laughs> yeah. <to> an hour. <laughs> I appreciate it and so one thing I wanted to add too is that um after you've taken your pet to the veterinarian and you may need some assistance uh, and you're not sure if the emergency that your pet is experiencing um, is eligible for face assistance please call us we love it when people call, they just, they, they want clarification. Um, we're, we are more than happy at FACE to answer whatever questions you may have. Um, and even if people, even if you're not in an emergency situation and you have some questions, give us a call and we're more than happy to, to answer questions too. So, um, so good job. And um, we do have some questions that came through. Um, if you want to go ahead and unshare your screen, um, then we can go ahead and go over some of the questions. So one of the first ones, um, this person wants you to talk about fevers. What is an emergency versus what you can watch and try to medicate at home and for how long the duration? Did you say for fevers? Yeah, I broke a little bit. Okay, sorry, I broke out a little bit. Um, oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, so fevers are, um, and you know, you might hear the word hyperthermia versus a fever. Um, a lot of it's semantics for, for you guys, um, but really an elevated temperature, you know, is, is what we're kind of referring to. So um, it depends on the underlying cause. So we can definitely have high fevers from, or high temperatures, I should say, from stress. Um, you know, we see that not infrequently um, in the veterinary clinic where pets temps, you know, they're like panting and they're like, who are you? And where's my mom? So their temp's gonna be a little bit high, um, but that can also be a sign of infection, inflammation, you know, cancer sometimes. So, um, you know, a lot of owners are comfortable checking their pet's temperature at home. Um, so if you, you know, do that and it's just, you know, titch above normal, your pet's a little stressed, you know, probably not something to worry about with the caveat being that it could be the start of something more serious. So um, if in conjunction with your pet being lethargic, not eating, um, you know, certainly other things like vomiting, diarrhea, that would definitely be a cause to have your, your pet checked out. But, you know, like I said, if it bumps up a little bit and then kind of comes back down when they're calmer, then probably not um, a problem. But certainly, again, if they're feeling unwell, then I'd, I'd have your vet check them out. Okay. There's a second part to this question I think is really interesting. And and it, I'm sure it depends on the, the pet, but it, it, when you're talking about fever, how high is too high? And this person also wants to know, how can you tell if the dog 
is if a dog is shivering due to a fever versus pain of unknown etiology. Yeah, so shivering is um, really not specific. I have two chihuahuas and they're shivering all, you know, they just shiver and yeah. Um, <laughs> but they can definitely shiver from pain, stress, illness. Um, you know, fever is kind of hard to say because usually if they're feeling unwell or painful for whatever reason, they'll be shivering too. Um, so I think, you know, if you check their temperature and it's normal, um, you know, you're kind of feeling up and down, petting them, you know, rubbing them, um, and they're not reacting painfully, then, you know, if they do have a fever, it would be a little worried something else internally is going on. Um, but uh, I don't know if that answers your question. Um, oh, and so yeah, so if if the if the dog is shivering due to fever versus pain of unknown etiology. So, um, okay, let's go on to a couple of others. What are signs of constipation, and when is it serious? Yeah, so constipation um, would be uh, either absence of defecation for you know, again, varies by the animal. So not to be graphic, but you know, not every person animal defecates the same frequency and all, all that per day. Um, so if for your pet, they're going an abnormally amount of times. So like my dogs are like clockwork. They eat their breakfast, they go do their business and, and that's it. Um, but if for my dogs personally, if we're getting on to, you know, maybe the next day or the day after in conjunction with straining. So looking like they're trying to posture and defecate but nothing is coming out. Um, maybe if they do pass a little nugget and it's very dry looking, then that could, would worry you maybe that they're constipated. Um, you can't always tell. So um, sometimes in those cases we'll get an X-ray and there's like a certain appearance um, of the feces in the colon um, on X-rays that supports them being a little bit dried out and, and constipated, but probably the most common thing just to summarize would be if they're um, posturing to defecate, but nothing is coming out. And it's been, you know, probably at least a day, I'd say it would be a safe period of time um, without defecating. Okay. How long after a dog eats should I wait until they start to play and run around? I have two labs and they love to chase each other and romp, but I worry about twisted intestines. How long after they eat can they play? Yeah, so there's not really a set time. Um, generally, you know, an hour to two hours is probably safe. Um, walking around a little bit is, is probably okay, but if your labs play, it sounds like the way that they do play, then um, I'd probably try to limit them from doing any romping or, or running or anything like that um, for at least an hour, if not two, to be safe. Um, and then, you know, some vets, and it's easier in female dogs when they're getting spayed because, of course, their belly is, you know, open, um, but some uh, owners will pursue kind of what we call prophylactic gastropexy, um, where when they're getting, you know, spayed or neutered under anesthesia, they'll have that stomach um, suturing procedure done. Um, so, you know, hopefully your dogs will never need <laughs> surgery, but it's something to consider as well if they ever need it for another reason. We'll often recommend a gastropexy. Um, so we kind of skimmed through the that sort of um, you know, abdominal emergency section, but um, you know, it's it's just something to think about. Um, you know, prophylactically, some surgeons can do it laparoscopically as well. Um, but of course it is anesthesia. So, you know, if you can keep them calm for a period of time um, <laughs> to your best um, after they eat, then that's usually the safest thing. Oh, those labs. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, do you have any recommendations for calming a stressed pet, for example, during fireworks? Mm. And when should a stressed pet be brought in for assistance? Yeah, so, um, you know, I think that kind of comes down to, you know, your pet best. So some pets can be calmed by their owner just holding them and talking to them and, and that's all they need. Um, other animals are inconsolable and they need a little bit of um, pharmacological support, we'll say. Um, mm -hmm. So there are um, a couple of oral sedative options that work very well um, in dogs. So trazodone and acepromazine are the most common sedatives that we use. Um, so I have plenty of clients that come in on July 2nd or 3rd and, you know, they're like, my dog gets anxious and I just need something to take the edge off for them. Um, so you know, there's oral medications we can do. Um, and then some owners will get on if you've heard of those thunder shirts are like really kind of tight. Um, sort mm -hmm. of guess, <laughs> pretend like it's giving you a hug. I'm, um, shirts <laughs> for them. So I, I have some clients as well that say, you know, they live and die by the thunder shirt. So they just kind of put mm -hmm. it on them beforehand. They put them as internally into the house as they can to try and, you know, uh, box out some of that noise. Um, 
but um, I, I find that usually the ones that can't be consoled with, you know, just you holding them or whatnot, just generally need some sort of sedative yeah. to be able to provide that for you. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up Thunder shirts because I was going to um, ask you about that. I see a lot of dogs with Thunder shirts. Mm -hmm. uh, to make a dog vomit, how much hydrogen peroxide are you to give your pet? Yeah, so um, I'm going to get a kind of a non-committal answer to that, um, mostly because uh, <laughs> definitely never give proxy to your cats ever. <laughs> um, but mm -hmm. uh, the only concern with us kind of giving those dosage recommendations is that peroxide is not without risk. Um, they can aspirate, um, it can cause damage to their stomach. So really, I don't ever recommend giving peroxide at home unless very, very extenuating circumstances. So we've had clients call and they're mm -hmm. like, my nearest vet's like three hours away. And they're like, okay, well, you know, um, but it's, we generally don't recommend it. So um, I would, you know, if your dog eats something, uh, you know, definitely your cat um, at home that they shouldn't have the safest things usually to get them in for us to give an injection of a medication to help them vomit um, and not try to, um, you know, force things down the back of their throat that they can inhale and, and hurt their lungs. Right. Okay. Well, that looks like that is all of our questions, unless someone has one more that they want to have us answer. But um, again, thank you so much for, for taking the time to being here. I know that you are very, very busy, and we really appreciate you coming in. Um, what, what I am going to ask people to do, if there are questions that you had that we didn't have a chance to answer, please feel free to send me an email. It's admin, A-D-M-I-N, at faith, then the number four, pets.org. And I can go ahead and forward them to Dr. O'Donnell. Everyone will receive a survey after we are finished today. And I love recommendations. If there are any other types of webinars that you want to hear from us, we're, we're more than happy to, to see what we can do to schedule one of those. So thank you again, Dr. O'Donnell, and thank you everybody for being here, and um, we'll see you next time. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye.